so this is the second part of an answer to um, the Victoria Shows art Victoria Derbyshire Shows article that went out on the seventh of March, twenty nineteen, uh, which was a hatchet job of the Hallwang Clinic, uh, which I went to in twenty seventeen, and they saved my life. Uh, I wasn't happy about the piece that went out. Uh, neither a lot of other people, and I've had to split the videos into two to get them up onto uh, social media. So this is the second part of an answer to their second article on crowdfunding overseas clinics, but mainly on the whole line clinic. For some reason, we now go into a bit of film that's not related any, in any way to what it says in its some patient story. And, and most patient stories there are tragic. And I think this is another one where, you know, someone felt they must do it rather than being, and it's, and it's difficult to be cool, calm and, you know, cold about the decision. But it's, you know, a relative wants to save them, they want to save themselves because they think it's the right thing to do. Whether they knew whether the treatment would help them or not, there are some cases where you, people do, they know exactly what they want and they go there for it. And there are some cases where people just turn up and hope to be cured. And I think it's most of them that are unfortunate. But it's just my opinion. What do I know? Andrea was loyal. She was funny. She was a huge part of my life. Claire's best friend, Andrea, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2016. A single mum with two young boys, she was told she had a year to live. The two friends flew together to Germany for treatment at the Haowang. The treatment, now they never promised her a cure, but they did believe they could get her into remission, which at best would have given her five years. And in those five years, we weren't really sure of what could come about. And miracles do happen. Other families say doctors at the Haowang seem very careful to avoid the word cure, but they say phrases like remission and beating cancer are used in ways that doctors in the UK have told us is irresponsible. The Haowang says it is honest about prognosis and does have its patients' best interests at heart. In a statement, it told us, we never talk about cure, nor do we use phrases like beat it. Our medical team consists of oncologists, not sports commentators. But in a marketing video, still on the front page of the clinic's website, a British patient can clearly be heard using that phrase. After speaking with the medical team, um, we decided that um, they said that they, could, they were very positive and that they could um, you know, work with me to try and um, <clears throat> obviously beat, beat my cancer. But this, uh, this whole section covers... Uh whether they tell you there's a cure or not. Uh, and in my personal experience, they, they never talk of cure. You know, they talk of, you know, you're doing really well, there's a possibility, but they don't, when you go there, they don't talk of cure, in my experience. And you've just watched the lady from Northern Ireland also say they were never promised a cure, but they talked about remission, right? Now, I've had talk of remission, cure, etc. from the NHS. And at one point, I thought I was cured, only to be told I was terminally ill. And yeah, so I didn't actually know where I stood, and I had a completely wrong impression of where I was due to, to be honest, lack of information and lack of honesty with the patient from the NHS, <laughs> not the clinic. And then they get a statement from the clinic saying, we would never talk of cure. And, and <laughs> yeah. They haven't actually got a shred of evidence to say that they use the word cure to anyone. You know, I, I've had a got bit of hearsay from people that they have in personal conversations with people in the uh, clinic. So maybe they do, but I can't prove that they do or do. I can only give you my experience. You've heard other people speaking. Uh, and then they cut to uh, this uh, testimonial, which, which they refer to as a marketing video. <laughs> marketing video. I'm going to come on to the Hallwang's marketing because it actually needs addressing. They're, they are, they're not very good. This is not a marketing video. This is a testimonial from a patient still alive now. I sent him a message on Facebook this morning uh, after Stephen Powell got in touch with me last night because he knows them. They've met at the clinic, so I'm just sort of putting him in touch again. Mark, this is... In fact, I'm not going to use his name. I'll, I'll delete that bit out. 
Now, this is a, a patient still alive. I'm in contact with him. He refused to take part in this programme because, unlike me, he sussed that they were just going to do a hatchet job. I wouldn't have anything to do with it. Uh, so they've used his testimonial. No, it's not a marketing video. It's his testimonial um, to try and say that the clinic uses phrases like beat it. And they're actually his words. And he's, at, like Stephen Powell, this chap, well, in fact, I'm going to use his name because he's given me permission. This is Mark Hurd from the northeast of England. He's given me permission to put his story out and use his name. So I'm going to. And his story is actually the clearest case of someone being refused funding for uh, cancer treatment that will obviously work on him. He's got far more evidence than me and it's a much more straightforward case. And I cover it in my blog. And if you read it and think that that's the way to go about things in the U UK, he's got a specific type of cancer, which he's had a biopsy analysed in the States at his own cost to show that none of the standard authorised treatments on the NHS for that form of cancer would ever work on him. He's got colorectal cancer, um, but his cancer expresses HER2, which is normally found in breast cancer patients. So the whole one clinic have treated him with HER2 um, related drugs for breast cancer and in six months his tumour has reduced 50%. He's now 12 months in and he's heading towards getting clear. Yeah, I'm not going to use the word cure either. But his tumours have just reduced. This treatment is working on him. He's got a biopsy analysis that shows what treatment will and won't work on him. He's been to a clinic, had the treatment, has the results from that treatment. But he can't have that treatment in the UK funded because the drugs he's getting that are working are only authorised for breast, can breast cancer. They're not authorised for colorectal cancer. And if, if you think that's the way to go about authorising drugs for cancer, you're as barking as NHS England. Uh, but anyway, my, my main point was, he's fuming about this uh, and he's got, I've got permission from him to, to tell his story. And then I post up what he posted up on Facebook immediately after this piece went out. He's not a happy man, I have to say. As for Andrea, at the Haowang, she was given a form of immunotherapy. This new type of drug uses the body's own immune system to destroy tumour cells. She could barely put one foot in front of the other sometimes, and for her to take herself away from her boys was heartbreaking. But her belief was she was doing this in the short term for the long term. New immunotherapy drugs have been shown to extend life in a minority of patients with skin and blood cancers, but pancreatic cancer is much harder to treat. Well, let's, let's try and catch those points uh, about immunotherapy. Um, I mean, it, they, they say it's uh, been shown to be successful on a minority of patients with a minority of cancers. And what they're talking about there is it's only been trialled for use against populations of patients where the, the statistics are going to be hit. In terms of skin cancer, the immunotherapy drugs that I was looking for are now in common use on the NHS for melanoma. But thousands of people get quite a nasty form of melanoma, melanoma every year. You know, we're into the tens of thousands. And a lot of them die. And this new immunotherapy drug is actually been very, very successful, incredibly successful compared to previous treatments, right? But I, my condition, there's only 200 people a year, if if that, I don't know, that would that get my form of cancer. 200 in a population of 54 million. If if they could cure them all, it won't make a dent in the NHS statistics. And it wouldn't make a, a penny of profit for any company wanting to go through the trials process. And that's why up until actually this year, oh no, last year, late last year, no one's ever done it. There is a new drug coming through because a uh, some of the immunotherapy drugs are the new, new thing. And everyone's trying to produce them because they're actually very, very efficient. And there's a new drug coming up for my condition which is going through trials on a very low patient population and has already been fast-tracked in the States and 
if I can live long enough, it might be here too. And I've just been lucky because they're trying to sneak it into the system and get it authorised for one specific cancer. And then they can say, and it works on this and this and this and this and start doing trials on it. Whereas if they try and put it up against the existing ones, they'll just get told, we've already got well, something that does that, we don't want yours. So they've, they've picked on my condition because there is no licence treatment. So I actually might benefit from this essentially business decision of theirs um, yeah, if the NHS ever make it available for use. So I, I, I dispute the fact that uh, immunotherapy has only been shown to work on a minority of cancers. Again, if you go off and have a look at it, it's been successful on an awful lot of forms of cancers, but it does tend to be the more non-hormonal the non -hormonal ones. Yeah. But I don't know if that's true. Go and research it yourself. Cancer, immunotherapy. You won't find a great deal in the UK, but you'll find an awful lot of the states and an awful lot of medical research work and, and more academic papers you'll be able to read in a month on immunotherapy. So to say it's only effective on a minority of cancers is not true, in my opinion. Uh, doctors, um, to talk about um, uh, pancreatic cancer. I don't know the specifics of pancreatic cancer. I haven't got it. Um, I'm quite good on my form of cancer, but I don't bother looking at the rest of them because there's too many of them. And uh, I think they said something about uh, five years survival would be false hope. Well, no one's actually said that yet. The only person that's mentioned five years survival is me, and they use my comments. But the lady you've just seen talked about remission. Yeah, and uh, she's probably, you know, they've already pushed, you know, what's the best I can get out of this? And they've not probably said to them, well, the best you can hope for is to go into remission and then we manage it. So they're not promising them anything. You know, if you speak to an NHS doctor and say, what's my best bet here? You won't get a straight answer. You're not going to say, you know, you, you, the, the rules for the um, benefits for terminal cancer patients used to be, um, you had to get a doctor to say that you would be dead in six months. Now, if you have yet to meet, meet a doctor that will predict someone's death accurately, um, until they're in the last couple of weeks and it's obvious they're dying. And that's what used to happen. So people would get their benefits of being terminally ill while they're in the hospice for two weeks. And uh, that sort of suited everyone because the government didn't even have to pay out much. Well, apart from the patients, obviously, but you're, you're bottom of the list of pecking order as a patient. Whereas now, you just have to get a GP to certify that you have a terminally ill prognosis and back it up. And then you can be terminally I'm, I've been terminally ill for four years now. I'm probably hacking off the government because I get full PIP every month off them. And thankfully for that, because I can't go out to work at the moment. And so, <laughs> you know, th this thing about talking about five years of out, nobody has other than me. And I didn't even feature. That lady certainly didn't mention it. And I don't think, you know, no one gives you a time span. As, they all, as they've already said a number of times, these drugs are new drugs and the experience of them is growing but it's been growing for only a couple of years you know dosages still aren't spot on they're enough to get through trials how long do we have to give them for do we have to give maintenance do they have to be all the time these are questions that are still being answered but the the, the tricky thing is that until they're answered fully or to a degree that the NHS agree is suitable to safeguard patients, they won't be authorised for use on the NHS. But there is a massive weight of evidence that they're useful to people with a certain condition. And that's why people go to get them, because there's a massive weight of, weight of evidence. I cannot wait for the glacial progress of NHS England to authorise a useful treatment for my condition. I'd be, I'd be dead if I hadn't gone to jail. I would be dead by now. So because I can't wait, my cells don't wait. They're doing their stuff all the time, while people are scribbling appointment letters and stuff. My cells are doing what they do in my body, and some of them aren't doing what I want them to do. So yeah, I do get quite annoyed about that. and the false hope thing again. You know, any talk of this would be false hope. Well, there wasn't any, so you're just using that as an excuse to go. Mm, if they've been told this, you know, it's pretty rubbish, isn't it, really? Three UK specialists we spoke to said it was extremely unlikely to have much effect. All said any talk of five-year survival would have been false hope. 
Andrea's friends raised more than £200,000 for her treatment. She had paid for therapy in Belfast and made multiple trips to the Howang, but she died in August 2017, just over a year after she was diagnosed. Do you think it was worth her going to that clinic? The outcome was the same, but do I think it was worth it? I couldn't turn around and say it didn't help Andrea, but if we were faced with it again, would we do it? Yeah, because you don't know. It didn't have any success, and that maybe sounds like I'm contradicting myself, but I wouldn't want to take away hope for somebody else. And that's a key point. Taking away hope for someone else. As they said, they don't know. There's such a lot of new treatments coming through at the moment that you don't know. I didn't know whether it would work on me. I hadn't got a clue. But what did I have to lose going there? My personal pension. What did I have to lose by not going there? My life. Definitely. So, your personal pension against your life. So, I think the Americans say it's a no-brainer. But one of the things she said there is, you know, we didn't know. These things do happen, you know. And, and they do, and that makes people optimistic. And you shouldn't really be making these decisions from an optimistic point of view. You should be looking at them cold hard facts. And if you do it cold hard facts, it, 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 it takes a real push to go and do it. If you do it emotionally and just on the back of hope, or whatever type of hope, on the back of hope, you're actually setting yourself up to fail. If you do it with, you know, and I always say, plan for the worst case, hope for the best. And, and, and you know, so plan for my death. I thought, this is worth a go. It's worth going at, because otherwise I'm dead in a month. Uh, and when you're faced with that, and, you know, you think there's, there's actually a good chance, yeah, tell me you wouldn't make that decision. Anyway, she talks about taking the hope away, and that's one of the things that's really annoyed me about this programme. I've had a fantastic response to treatment and I know not everyone gets it. Asking patients, relatives, whether it is worth it going there yeah, it is such a difficult question because their relatives died and they're now faced with, you know, would they, you know, they, would, they would have died anyway. You know, tell you that for nothing, they would have died anyway. But was it worth it? You know, she hadn't died a year after her diagnosis. Be interesting to see how long she was given. Well, I, don't, I don't know. No, I'm certainly not going to contact her and ask her. But some people get extra time. As I say, I know a patient who would give me given 24 hours to live, and only that was in 2016, and died this year because cancer kills people. You know, let's keep that uppermost in our mind. Cancer kills people. I've had two extra years. So I can sit here, still alive, saying that was worth it for me. Um, but if we, you know, patients who's taking them there, some people don't respond to treatment. So some respond for a short while and then regress. And I think, to be honest, that's everyone. I'm, I'm deteriorating now because I haven't had any treatment for 15 months. Um, and, and if I don't get any treatment, then I'll die this year. Funding, no funding or anything. If I don't get treatment, I will die. And it's as simple as that. Uh, I know I can go straight out to the clinic tomorrow if I wanted to, or I could afford it, and I know that they would clear the cancer in my body to certainly 95% again in three months. And that's very tough to take, but for people whose relatives have died, asking them whether it was worth going, that's got to be a very, very difficult question. Well, it gave her a lot of hope. You know, did it, you know, but what I'd like to have heard more of was, did it give them quality of life? Did it give them a bit of extra time to come? Because that extra time allows you to look at it again. Look at everything again. You're not trying to chase life when you're dying. You actually, in my case, I almost died. And then all of a sudden, I've got my life back. And I thought, this could happen again. I need to I need to change who I am and how I think. And I'm, I'm well, you have to take my word for it. I'm a much more personable person now. <laughs> Uh, there's probably people shouting at uh, the uh, film but I've also come to terms that that extra time has been worth its weight my wife has as well we, we're now yes it, there's a real chance of me dying but we're much more ready for that now 
And that has all been due to this claim. Nothing else. No, anyone try and say it could be anything else. No, it, it, it wasn't. It was entirely down to the treatment I got at this clinic. Uh, and I'll get emotional if I carry on. But go and ask uh, relatives of people who've died there whether it was worth it. I mean, how would you answer that? Yeah. What price would you have put on your mother, daughter, son's life? Should you have tried? Should you not have tried? And someone else could go there, get the same response as me, feel exactly the same as me. In fact, people are. People have been. I get contacted by them. I'm still in contact with them. It, I think it's a, a small proportion of the clinic's patients, but every single patient from the UK who goes there is dying. They're not at the start of their uh, cancer diagnosis. They are dying and they're, most of them at the end of it. I actually think that if a few people went to the start, they'd have about 100 times more uh, possibility of... You know, getting clear of it. I wish I'd gone two years early. I wish I'd gone in 2015 when they told me there was nothing else. I didn't have tumours all the way through my body and my cancer would have been easy to treat. It was two years later that I went when I was almost dead. So I wish I'd gone then. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll move on. I'm talking far too much in these. Uh, I'll start slurring and you'll get bored. When it comes to experimental treatment, patients with a terminal diagnosis may of course be far more willing to take risks and the NHS has been criticised in the past for being too conservative. But specialists we've spoken to say if a drug has not been tested and licensed for that type of cancer, the chances of it working are likely to be very low and there's a risk of serious side effects. I have one particular um, patient that went to that clinic and um, um, they refused a lot of the conventional treatments over in the UK. They went there, they got a, a range of unusual treatments and um, it's very sad to see that happen. I'm not actually certain how the doctors can really sleep at night when they, um, when they uh, give them treatments that are, are really not proven. I also never received a letter uh, from that clinic. We never knew really what they were getting. We only got it from the patient. And when they came back with problems, we have to deal with that. Now, this doctor had me shouting at the television uh, because it, I'm pretty sure he's the one that said all these treatments are available over here and they're not. And they make some, uh, they make some comments there that, that need a bit more discussion. I'll try not to waffle on too much here because I'm making this film far longer than it should be. The NHS too conservative. Well, that's exactly what Tessa Jowell said when she stood up in the House of Lords and made her speech. Go and Google it, go and watch it. The NHS is too conservative. Experimental treatments should be made to terminal patients. End of. Uh, if they're not tested and authorised for use on the NHS, the chances of success are very low and there's a chance of serious side effects. Well, to be honest, that's rubbish. Oh, well, the only reason they get authorised is because they've been through trials. So they've actually been proven to be better than the current treatment used. If it hasn't been through trials, it doesn't get authorised. Full stop. All right, so to say that the chances of success are low, the chances of success could be incredibly high. They just haven't been authorised yet for their use on the NHS. Serious side effects. Immunotherapy has serious side effects because it's in its infancy. To say that just because it hasn't, isn't authorised on the NHS, the stuff authorised on the NHS has incredibly serious side effects, but they're rare. If you switch off the immune system's self-regulation, it decides what it's going to attack, and it doesn't stop. And if it decides it doesn't like your liver, that's what it goes for. And that's the serious side effect. Your immune system eating your vital organs. And that can happen on the NHS with authorised drugs because immunotherapy is essentially taking a blunt stick to your immune system and if you combine it with other things that takes a better blunt stick to your cancer and the, the two things together you know, an unregulated immune system and a weakened uh, tumour you know, they get into each other the immune system isn't going to stop the tumour's uh, weakened result, no tumour but to say well, if not authorised, there's a chance of serious side effects. You could go into an NHS hospital tomorrow, be treated with pembrolizumab for melanoma, all authorised, and it could kill you. And they will tell you that. And they'll make you sign to say that you know that it could kill you. So, what he's saying is rubbish. 
Uh, and then he talks about a patient who, who's, I would say, in my experience of meeting patients at the whole long, is unusual. Re refusing conventional treatment, um, to be honest, although I have done it since I was told I was terminally ill, I've refused platinum-based chemotherapy. But at the start of your cancer treatment, unless you understand your own cancer incredibly well, and trust me, as a cancer patient, you don't, and unless you understand what treatment's available and how effective it is at the start of your cancer journey, and as I said, as, as a patient, I didn't. You know, I, I believe my doctors. What they're doing is a standard treatment. It must be right. And I actually thought it was doing me good, and it wasn't at all. I never had any chance of doing so. But standard treatment works extremely well on an awful lot of cancers, especially the more common cancers because there's more research and more work done on that because everyone wants to reduce the numbers. Although the pharmaceutical companies are happy that the numbers are large to be reduced because they make a lot of money out of it. But everyone wants to reduce a lot of numbers. The, the NHS doesn't like its stats. Other countries want to reduce it. None of us want to die of cancer. But to, to use an example, a patient that's refused conventional treatment and then describe the treatment at the hallway as unusual uh, and then following that up by saying, I never got anything from them, so, so how do you know it's unusual? You know, I showed my treatment plan to my NHS consultant, um, who I think was seeing me unofficially, um, and he said, oh, that's quite a cocktail. And then we discussed each bit. Which was great for me, but not everyone has that sort of relationship. And then he says these these treatments are not proven. Well, not to the level that the NHS wants to authorise them. But there's always, in my experience, certainly on my treatment, there's always a good body of evidence. And if you push the people at the clinic, as I do, because I'm inquisitive and, and I'm also a cynic, to explain your treatment to you, they will. Exactly how it works. To the point where... It was. I'm not stupid, but it was beyond me. But I understood. I understood the basis of it, and I, when he told me things, I thought, "Yeah, that's believable." And then I went off and started researching what he said was true. So you can check it all yourself. But they're not proven to the level where they're going to be authorised on the NHS. But that's why people are going there. And uh, how can they sleep at night? Well, how can they sleep at night? Well, because they're doing their best, right? And their intentions are good. I just. I don't, personally, my, one of my criticisms of the clinic is that they don't present themselves in uh, a professional enough way. Uh, and maybe they should start saying on the thing, you actually, rather than not saying they give you a cure, start saying, we, are, we don't promise a cure. Actually say it. We do not promise a cure. We do not promise to cure you of cancer. We will treat it with the latest treatments we have available. Blah, 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 blah. And actually start doing that. I've spoken to them about this before, but they're an unregulated clinic in Germany, and there is a movement in Germany to get rid of all unregulated uh, clinics uh, because they're, they're not just cancer. There's all sorts of things. When they keep saying there's loads of cancer clinics, they're not expanding. This is a, a standard part of the medical, well, it's not part of the medical German medical system, but they're allowed to continue, and they provide alternative treatments, newer treatments, privately to people. Uh, he got nothing from the clinic. I mean, this is this is the NHS doing everything by letter, you know. So when you go uh, and see a consultant somewhere, your GP gets like my GP complains. Not my current GP. But I think my one I see you sometimes don't see the same one. And my GP complained about all the letters on the system because they get them from everywhere. I've seen. I think I've been to four different hospitals and they get all these letters from everywhere. And they just uh, that's what they do in the NHS. My notes are scattered around the country. Nobody's got a full record. Nobody in the UK has got a full record of my treatment. My notes are scattered around the country. But there are letters flying about left, right and centre. Why should the clinic write to him? I, I've actually tried a number of times to get the NHS to work with this clinic. Um, and actually, that was the clinic's suggestion. When I told them I, was, I can't afford to come back, he said, you need maintenance, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. And I said, well... You know, the vaccine's always been a bit iffy because in the UK they're dead set against them at the moment uh, and he's insistent, but I don't quite know what it is. It's a vaccine. It's a generic one. It's not specific to my uh, uh, my um, tissue, my cancer. It's not specific. It's a generic one. 
And I know what it's meant to do, but I haven't quite narrowed it down yet. I'm getting there. Um, and I, and I su I've suggested a couple of times that we do it in conjunction that, you know, if the NHS thinks it's immunotherapy, you know, can I go there and have a vaccine at the same time? No, you cannot. If I go and have a vaccine, I've been told for this next treatment because I suggested it for that. And I've been told if I go and have a vaccine, uh, which I think will improve the chances of the treatment work, they will not treat me with the immunotherapy drugs. And I can't, I can't afford to not go and get... You know, the uh, professor in Southampton told me that those drugs are the most likely and the vaccine was a waste of time and I'd wasted my money. He then treated me with the drugs and at the end of it said, I was a bit, I was a bit miffed about that because the vaccine, over the, over the space of time, I had 10 different vaccinations and it cost me £40,000 and I was a bit miffed to be told that all that was wasted. But then we got to the end of the treatment and I didn't have as a spectacular result. And he said, hmm, perhaps I shouldn't have poo-pooed that vaccine. And actually I managed not to thump him. But there you go. But I did actually get the, the, the professor in Southampton and the doctor at the clinic talking to each other. I have no idea what went on, but I blogged about it and, it, and I, I used a picture of two stags rutting because that was what I thought it would be. There was two egos going at each other who didn't like what the other person did and we didn't get anywhere which was a shame because actually some of the things they're doing are, are worthwhile looking at but there is no interest in the UK unless it's come from NHS England there's no interest in new treatments at all and to be honest the knowledge of your standard NHS consultant on new uh, treatments for cancer is poor in my experience. And then he said, oh, when a patient was ill, uh, we had to deal with it. And if they did deal with it, good for them. But actually, what you tend to find is when you come back, and I said, I got fantastic support through my trip to Germany from my hospital, but I got the impression it was all unofficial and under the radar, and I don't want to get anyone in trouble for that. But you know, they put emergency cover in place in case I had side effects in between them. And, and that was a local decision to do that. You know, that I'd have a number to call, and I could go into hospital. They were aware I was receiving immunotherapy. I mean, maybe I've spoken out of turn saying that, but it was really good of them to do it. it you know, it's another, okay, because it was, there always is. The, you know, what if I get side effects in between? What am I going to do then? Um, so if they did deal with a patient, fantastic. But actually, most people's experience is that the NHS will not speak to you if you're having private treatment. If you, and if you've gone for private treatment, um, I was prescribed so a low dose of uh, uh, tablet chemotherapy to, so that I wouldn't get worse. And, and that was costing me €400 Euros, uh, for a month's supply. Now, it was exactly the same as my NHS consultants had suggested I have a palliative care, only the, the dosage is all different. In Germany, they think a low metronomic dose all the time is good. And in the UK, they think dosing you up to the eyeballs and then stopping it for three weeks and then dosing you again is the best way. And I, and I don't know which is, but the low dose sounded more sensible to me, so that's what I was taking. So I came back and asked for it and said, could you just prescribe me for this? Because you did suggest it. And he said, no, I'm not supplementing your private treatment. So, which is fair, well, you know, if that's how it works, that's how it works, but I thought I'd ask. And, and so, you know, there is quite a disconnect. If you go off for private treatment, even though you haven't, you've been refused it in the UK, even if you pay for, offer to pay for it yourself and you've been refused, and then you go and have it, you're treated as a bit of a pariah by the NHS. So if they did look after the patient, uh, good on them. But it's not the usual attitude from NHS England particularly and individual trusts. Uh, in my experience and the experience of patients I've spoken to. The Hao Wang says immunotherapy is complex and not well understood by other doctors. It claims it has treated cancer patients now in full remission with drugs which have not been licensed to use on that cancer. And it says if it can extend the lives of some patients by a year or more, that should be considered a breakthrough. Quickly, and that's true. You know, if, they, if they can extend your life for two or three years, trust me, that's worth going for. Yes, that's true what they say. Uh, and they have. And they say there's back to this thing of authorisation for NHS use. You know, Mark Hurd's case is the most ob obvious exposure of how ludicrous the system is that he has all the evidence that you can possibly have for what should be treating his cancer, and yet NHS England refuse to fund those drugs for his cancer because his health is not uppermost in their consideration. 
their own rules and procedures are uppermost in their consideration and they will not admit that they're wrong or that they should be changed or they should be more flexible because they're not flexible. NHS England are not flexible. So he's a chap who knows exactly what will treat his cancer, which is more than most. If, if they did the same, if, if the same testing that Marcus had done on his biopsy was done for every cancer patient in the UK at the start of their treatment, the first thing you get is a list of what will work and what won't work. Now, that would save the NHS an absolute fortune in wasted treatment, and it'd give the patient uh, a pointer straight away as to whether anything will work, you know, that's currently on the thing, they'll know. So why isn't it done? It cost him £5,000 privately. You can now get the test in the UK from a private company for about £1,500, because I've been considering doing it. But you know, it's another 1500 quid. Um But that, against the cost of cancer treatment over a long period, which is a waste of time, you know, if you could spend 1500 quid at the start of cancer treatment and go, this will probably work on you and this will probably work on you, so that's what we should try. Or nothing's going to work on you, I'm terribly sorry. Or rather than say, we're going to give you this for two years, when you actually, actually your report shows it's never going to work on you in a month of Sundays, that would save the NHS an absolute fortune and stop patients being confused about what their options are. In my opinion. When you're on this conveyor belt, you're living day by day. In yesterday's programme, we heard from Helen. Um, I just want to, I just want Her daughter, Gemma, was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. She made numerous trips to the Howang with money raised by the actress Kate Winslet, as well as the family and the public. Gemma was given immunotherapy, and for a while it seemed to work. Scans back in the UK showed no sign of the tumours. It's so mentally, physically, and, and whatever way you want to describe it, draining, going to Germany for treatment every three weeks. I just thought it was a good time to take a break. Helen said they were told by the Haowang to continue the treatment, but funds were getting low and they were worried there might be nothing left if the cancer came back. So they felt there was no choice but to stop their trips to Germany. It's unsustainable. You cannot physically carry on or financially carry on doing that for the rest of your life how could you how can you, anybody do that last summer another scan showed the cancer had returned this time in Gemma's spine she died in october coming back that's a hard bit helen is very grateful for the donations and for kate winslet's support she thinks it did give her daughter more time but looking back she cannot be sure she did the right thing you know, it becomes your life. You do not do anything else except get on that plane, go and have your treatment, come rest three weeks, get back on the plane, do it, and, and that's it. That's your life. There's no happy times. I do think to myself, should we have done the bucket list and spent the last few months of, of Gemma's life with the daughter trying to be happy and make, and make memories. But it's, it is what it is. It's, it's done now. You can't, you can't go back. On the Howell Wang's website, Gemma's case is still being used as a success story. There is no mention of the fact she lost her life five months ago. When people do pass away, they should be taken down and not used as marketing material. To use them in a positive manner, which is the only way it can be described as, to promote their story and get more people to go, is absolutely wrong. Well, I just heard from Helen Sprouts again, as I said in the first uh, film, she makes some quite good points there, um, and, and it, you know, she really paints a poor picture. But she's actually, and I'm going to find it so difficult to write about, but I'm, I feel I have to. She has completely misrepresented her story and the clinic's role in her daughter's death. And that needs to come out, I mean, quite quickly. The, the, they went to the Hallwine Clinic and, and the majority of the money they had, as far as I can see, and I, I believe they did start funding it themselves and then Kate Winslet got involved and their fund went to something like £350,000. And um, I wish mine had. <laughs> but they went to, you know, and so they were actually not going, or the bulk of the money was not theirs. 
And they got to a point where general was clear, so that the end said, there's no happy times. I was getting better every time I went. I could not wait to get on the train, on the on the plane to get across to Germany. I loved going to that clinic. It was, as I said, it was a nice place to be ill. And when you're getting better, it's fantastic. So I don't believe there's no happy times when you're going from being almost dead to, towards clear. And she got to the point where she was declared NED, no evidence of disease. That's where they say it seemed to be working. That she by an NHS hospital. This was not by the clinic. This was an NHS hospital scan and she was told she was NED. The clinic said she needed to continue and do maintenance doses. And they said a similar thing to me uh, and I haven't so uh, because I can't afford to really, realistically. The, the maintenance of my treatment is just too, it's too high a price for me to find and raise anymore without putting themselves in financial stress. Um, but in their case, when they they were told by they were told to continue by the clinic, and they decided not to go, and she says funds were getting low. But there's actually a, an update on their funding um, uh, page, which says we've only got one hundred and seventy five thousand pounds left, and that won't go far. And I thought, good for me, <laughs> I could go back and carry on. You know, that would have paid for seven further visits for me at £25,000 a time. So I thought, actually, that's actually quite a lot of money. And that would, you know, that would, that, that would, you know, I, I wouldn't mind having only £175,000 left of other people's money. And, and then, then we get on to the testimonial and the testimonials all up there. Her testimonial was given freely when they were deliriously happy that the clinic had got them after being told there was nothing that could be done to NED, and that's when they did that testimonial. And now she's complaining that it's still being up with no indication of uh, that Jim has passed away. Well, actually, I think the clinic have taken it down now, although if it was me, I wouldn't have done. Um, I'd have annotated it with what happened afterwards because they made their own decision not to go back to the clinic. I believe they went back when it was far too late uh, and the cancer had come back because that's what cancer does. You know, it doesn't leave you. You know, you might get rid of your tumours, but whether you get rid of the cancer cells is, a, is another matter. So, you know, you need regular maintenance. It, it, that's in my opinion, and I'm no doctor. But to complain about the testimonials still being up there, or she could have got in touch with them and said, would you mind just annotating it? And I said, they're not, they're not very good online, the whole thing, and they have to go to someone else to do these bits. For, for, and they're not very good at it at all. Um, but I actually think it's a bit hypocritical to complain about a testimonial still being up using your daughter's story when you yourself are still fundraising using the same story. And if you don't believe me, go and have a look for their fundraising. Uh, I'll have a screenshot from today uh, which shows it's still up and running. I've, I've certainly got one from the other day uh, where I donated, which is kind of me, I thought. So... And her fundraiser uses her daughter's story and Kate Winslet on it on the front page with no indication that her daughter has died. And there was still money going into it when I donated. You have to go back through some of the updates to find out where she announces her, her daughter has died. Now, she might be raising money for her daughter's daughter, you know, her granddaughter. And, and that would be fair. She might be raising money for local causes, but it isn't clear on that fundraiser. So... Yeah, these are not necessarily. I don't think she's done it intentionally. She's, you know, she's trying to defraud people by still fundraising. But you can't complain that someone's left a testimonial up, which you freely gave them, when you've left your fundraiser up and have done the same thing, not indicated that your daughter's done. And I know this is going to. What? What are you bringing this up, Paul? Paul, why are you bringing this? Her daughter's died of cancer. She's lost a daughter. She's been left with a granddaughter, and that's that's terrible for anyone. And yeah. But I'll go into it much more fully on my blog because I just think the, the, the impression they gave there was that the clinic let her down and the clinic actually got her to no evidence of disease. And I was told in the UK that if I was that far when they scanned me, I wouldn't need any more treatments. But I didn't believe it. Uh, and I wasn't anyway, so it, didn't, it was irrelevant. 
you know, I, I think I'll need maintenance treatment to keep me alive for the rest of my life, which is why I'm fighting for funding, because I can't afford, I can't sustain the cost of a maintenance treatment. But I'll go into it a bit further in my blog, I'll evidence what I say, because I know this is an incredibly emotive subject, and I know Ellen Sprouts is going to be very upset with me. But having said that, I was very upset with her two years ago, when she sent me a lot of abusive emails and told me lies about her daughter's cancer to try and get information out of me and I, I thought I don't understand how you can do that to a fellow cancer patient or someone who's gone through the same as you but you know uh, I'll comment on it in the blog because I'm waffling on again and this is going to be the longest video in Christendom if I can I might actually have to split them up and uh, put them in about four instead of two but this clinic is just one of many in Germany and beyond new technologies and new ways of funding mean the business of cancer care is booming selling hope to patients faced with a frightening diagnosis and a difficult choice. Jim Reed reporting. Uh, Athena on Twitter says, I totally understand the decision to crowdfund for treatment, but no data is collected, no evidence base is built, no future patients benefit. We must invest in research and work to change practice for all. I'm the CEO of a cancer research charity and this crowdfunding is having an, an impact. And this email from Gerald is quite long. I will, I'll read most of it. Uh, good morning. I think you provided a very balanced perspective on this terribly complex issue. My daughter Elaine spent almost five months at the Halwang Clinic before she sadly passed away last summer at the age of 35, leaving a two-year-old little boy. She had a very rare sarcoma cancer that couldn't be treated any further in the UK. And Gerald says this particular clinic caters primarily for Brits using crowdfunding on top of their own resources. Most of the patients that were there uh, with my daughter are no longer with us. And many families had taken on major financial commitments to fund treatment and they're left financially challenged as a result. We funded ourselves, but basically used up our savings. And if this treatment had continued, we would have struggled to be able to look after her son who is now with us. These clinics are often opaque about likely ongoing costs and even more opaque about outcomes. What most people don't get is that even if these treatments work, you need to basically continue. And if you stop, you will probably die. Uh, these clinics, says Gerald, are unable to attract wealthy Germans, of whom there are many. Uh, we only saw one German there in six months. Uh, without crowdfunding that doesn't really exist in Germany, these clinics would probably struggle. Uh, thank you for those. Do keep them coming in. So we got to the final sort of uh, wrap up of that piece and it's stuff coming in off uh, Twitter uh, and a comment from uh, Gerald, which I'll, I'll, I'll cover, and a thing about no wealth, no wealthy Germans. So, and they started off with selling hope. Um, they're not selling hope. Hope is what you have yourself. You know, uh, hope is what I had, that what I'd found I thought would work, would actually work. That's the hope. They're not selling me hope. You know, I was, I thought I was very lucky to find them, uh, to be honest. Uh, so first of all, Twitter. There was quite a lot of uh, activity on Twitter after these two went out. And it was mostly people jumping on it with no knowledge or experience of the clinic or patients that had gone there. Just making comments with their own ulterior motives. And she mentions two there. One on one, I didn't actually see, so I shall go looking for her on Twitter later. Uh, and she was saying, these clinics, blah, 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 you know, we should invest in research. Well, as, uh, as, and, and she said something about being in a cancer charity and she should invest in research. So presumably she's a cancer charity that funds research uh, or helps fund research, or raises funds for, for research. So, you know, that, yeah, crowdfunding. And then the other one was a CEO of a charity. Uh, and I think I actually saw a couple of CEOs getting on it and one of them mentioned snake oil. You know, and I said, have you any knowledge of what you're talking about? Uh, and the, the charities are really concerned about this because £20 million pounds raised on crowdfunding goes direct to the people raising it. You know, well, obviously website and the credit card processing fees. But that's a tiny amount out. If you, put, if you were to put £20 million pounds into a charity, you know, quite a lot of that would still be available but quite a lot of it would disappear in their costs. Uh, the CEO that I took it up with was, uh, I've forgotten her name, but she was the CEO of Bowel Cancer UK. And when I looked at their accounts, they raised 2.8 million in 2017 and 
1.4 million and went on staff costs. So 20 million pounds not going to them. They've still got those staff costs and uh, the, the potential of their income. So the charities are really concerned about this, but not because of patients' health. They're not, they don't want pay, they're not interested in the patients. They're interested in the money. And that's what a lot of people are interested in when it comes to cancer. And then we got a, uh, an email in from Gerald. Now, they've already mentioned Elaine, so I will as well, because I met Elaine, I think, every single time I went to Pauline. She seemed to be always be there. Um, and, and she seemed pretty happy about being there as well. And she knew that the, she was getting treatment, but she couldn't get it in, in the UK. She was getting treatment, but she wasn't sure whether it was going to work. Um, I, I'm only talking about her because Gerald's already gone public about his uh, daughter. Um, Gerald seems more hacked off about the money. Um, but you know, And he links the clinic to crowdfunding, and they're not linked to crowdfunding. I, as far as I know, I'm, I'm going to check. They don't have any crowdfunding logos. They don't tell you you have to do it. They're a private clinic. And I think there's a bit of a culture class here. The culture clash. They're a German private clinic. And for some people, going to Germany is a language barrier. But for others, it's a culture uh, barrier as well. There's a culture class. You know, without wanting to sound racist, Germans and British are not the same. Let's just leave it at that. They're not. They're, they, they approach things and think about things differently. Uh, and they don't tell you how, how to fund it how to fund a treatment, they tell you what treatment they plan to give you and how much it's going to cost. And, and until they've done all their analysis and uh, uh, of your tissue samples and the uh, the work, and that takes some time, and I was, I was fuming because I wanted to be there. And they said, no, you can't come until we've got all this analysis done that we've decided on your treatment plan, which actually encouraged me to go because I thought I was very professional. But... They, they won't do anything until they know what your cancer's doing. You know, they, don't, they don't just pump stuff in you. They look at what your cancer's doing. And then they'll give you a treatment plan. And when you say, and how much, and they say, and we need you to come to such and such for this many days. And people say, how much does that cost? And they give them a cost for the first visit. Uh, I served in Germany. A friend of mine put his car in for service. Uh, and they said, yeah, service. It. And he said, oh, there's, there's a couple of problems. Can you sort out anything that you find? Uh, now, we all had pretty beat-up cars, and they would cost, you know, a couple of thousand Deutschmarks, which wasn't a lot at the time. Uh, there was four to the pound, so you're paying five, six hundred quid for a car. Uh, some people bought new ones, but I couldn't drive them out there, and if I bought a new car, I'd wreck it. Uh, and his car was a pretty beat-up old car, and he put it into a German garage and just said, yeah, do whatever he's doing. And he got what he got back was, was beautiful. I mean, it was gorgeous. They'd re-welded his sills. They'd, they'd fixed everything. It ran fantastically. It looked good. It was brilliant. But he couldn't afford to pay the bill. <laughs> his, his bill his bill was about five times the value of his car. And he had to sell the car to pay it. And he still had his insurance to pay off. And he was a laughing. But that's what... You know, you tell, if you give him an instruction, that's what they do. How much would that cost? They'll give you precisely the cost. First visit, done. I think it's up to the patients to work out how long they're going to have to go and can they fund it and how to fund it. The clinic, the clinic, don't ask you how you're going to fund it. They tell you what they're going to treat you with and how much it's going to cost. And then it's up to you after that. And I think people should have a bit of responsibility for it. But as far as I was concerned when Elaine was, she was happy to be there. And in fact, to be perfectly honest, she spoke fluent German. And I got the impression that at least one relative that she stayed with, because she came in during the day, well, she didn't stay at the clinic, she came in during the day, that she was staying with a German relative, and I thought she actually had links into the German medical system. But I don't know her, her, her um, situation for definite. We chatted, that's all. She's actually, I think she's still a member of my group, even though she died the other year, there's a few of those. And she sadly did. But I, and I couldn't tell you whether she got extra time. I couldn't tell you whether it was better than the standard of care in the UK, but... She'd chosen to go there. She seemed reasonably happy about it when she was there, uh, but Gerald isn't. Um, I've written something else down that I can't read now. Um, some of the things he said were fair points. You know, there are, uh, it's a common complaint about the clinic that people don't know how long the treatment's going to go on for or how much the total cost will be. And some of that's down to the fact that Nobody quite knows how long the treatment's going to go on for. I started responding to something that they told me 
I'd respond to in six weeks minimum. And I started responding in two and a half to three weeks. Uh, and so three months got me to 95% clear. But at the start of that, they didn't know how long it was going to cost, how long it was going to take, and how much, you know, obviously don't know how long, I can't tell you how much. But what we did manage to get out was a minimum cost for the, min sorry, minimum period of treatment and how much the first treatment, because that's always the most expensive, because they normally have to treat you for various other things as well. And then what the repeat costs would be, and we got that out of them, and that we knew how much that was going to be, and we were lucky enough because I'd saved my personal pension and the army had paid me my army pension lump sum, we were lucky enough to know that we had that money in place. And I started crowdfunding because I didn't know how long it was going to go. And that is a common complaint, and I'll, I'll take that up with the... Uh, people say that they're not quite sure how it's going to cost, but there, there are reasons for this. It's how long is a piece of string. The way they approach cancer is that no two people's cancer is the same, and they should work out what your individual cancer is doing and treat that rather than say, what have you got? Where did it start? Have some of this. And yeah, I actually think it's a good approach. And they talk about wealthy Germans as well. I'll just quickly get that in because I'm still waffling on for far too long. Uh, wealthy Germans. The German medical system is completely different to us. And not all Germans like the unregulated clinics. And they actually have a far better cancer treatment uh, service in German clinics, in German hospitals, their, their health service, than we do over here. And their outcomes are better. And I hope I can find some stats to back that up. Um, in an interesting twist, Mark Heard, the gentleman I told you about before, if he'd gone to a private clinic and proved that cancer treatment worked on him, the clinic told me that he would then transfer into the German medical system and his treatment would be fully funded because he'd proved it worked on him. If only that was the case in the UK. So he would be treated on the German, and the German medical system runs on a private insurance system where everyone has to have private insurance, it's taking out your wages, and there's an amount allocated in benefits so they have private medical insurance so that people don't slip through the net. Uh, it's not a single tier system, you can boost your own medical insurance, but you have, as I understand it, it's quite a good basic level of uh, medical cover as standard for everyone in Germany. And all the hospitals and medical facilities are run by the private insurance companies who you pay out of your wages and your benefits uh, to provide those services. And it works. And I've, I've been to a couple of German hospitals where I was going to hold. I know I was a private patient, but when you go in, you don't have to walk past Costa Coffee and Marks and Spencers selling you sugary drinks. Uh, there isn't tons and tons of people wandering around with kettles and cups and clipboards and there aren't hundreds and hundreds of patients milling around, filling all the waiting areas. There just aren't. It's like, you go and you think, is it open? <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's one reception, one, and they tell you where to go. And off you trot, and you head down, and they see you. And they, I was I was seen 10 minutes late for my appointment, and the guy apologized to, apologized to me and said, I'm sorry, it's a trap around Stuttgart. One of the early patients was late. And he wasn't bothered with those private or within their system because anyone that turns up there at a German hospital you know, has paid somewhere or other and they just do what they're supposed to do. They're not in, they're not in bother about anything else. It's all either insurance or a private contract with the clinic. Uh, but being apologised to for being seen 10 minutes late is not an experience I've had very often in the NHS. So I'll, I'll leave it then. I'll cover everything in my blog. I think I'll do an end piece. There's even more droning me to come. And, and I say, I've, I've talked for so long, I may well end up splitting these videos up and having a series of them in my blog. But they're all, they'll link them all together and they're all worth watching, I think. Um, but I'll write about it in detail. Thank you.